Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm not surprised to see so many people here. It's not a bad subject to have a discussion on this week, is it? Um, the story, obviously, not yet over by any means. I thought probably there were, there were two things we would want to talk about this evening. First of all, just simply what is happening and what do we make of it? But secondly, what do we make of the way in which it's being reported? What do we make of the influence of new media, about which there has been a huge amount of discussion, of interactive media, and what effect might that have had on the way in which events have developed since the election last Friday? Wonderful panel up here uh, with a huge amount of knowledge. So what I thought we might do is ask each of them just to say a few words, just to open things up. I might then have a couple of questions, just possibly of my own, but the bulk of the evening obviously will be for you to make your points and to ask your questions. Um, let me just introduce the panel briefly. Kazra Naji on my left, a BBC colleague, a special correspondent of BBC Persian, which when did BBC Persian go on there? Uh, 16th of January, 14th right, of January. So less than a year ago. What fantastic timing. Six months ago. Um, Sina Motolevi, another BBC Suspicious. colleague. Um, BBC World Service Persian also. Uh, very good to see both of them here. Ashwin Ratanzi on my right, author and freelance journalist, developer, former presenter with Press TV. And on his right, Annabel Sreverni from SOAS, who has been looking at the way in which media and politics operate in Iran for quite a long time. And I'm director for the Centre for Media and Film Studies. And director of Media and Film Studies, so nobody better. Um, Kasia, would you like to start, just three or four minutes, your thoughts this Thursday evening? My thoughts, general thoughts. Yeah. Um, very interesting times, volatile times, dangerous times. And this is uh, probably, not probably, almost certainly the biggest challenge uh, to uh, the regime in Iran. And when I use the word regime, um, I use it because uh, I don't mean just the government, but all the centers of power that um, are built around it, uh, the Revolutionary Guards, the Bastille, the Guardian Council, the Supreme Leader, all these. So this is the biggest challenge. It really is, and uh, for 30 years. I think it's probably is not overdoing it to describe it as a turning point in the contemporary history of Iran in the last 50, 60 years. It's one of those uh, moments. Um, I am a bit worried, not a bit, quite a bit worried actually, because things can turn pretty ugly. Um, the fact is that um, everything is being played out, out on the streets um, and, and uh, the opponents of the government and the government uh, supporters are all trying to claim the streets. Mm. Uh, and, and uh, with the numbers that we've seen on the part of the oppositionists and uh, the number of numbers we've seen on the government side and the fact that, okay, the hardliners in Iran who are in power, um, I would have thought they're not going to relent that easily. Uh, it's going to be a, a confrontational situation here developing and I don't see how this thing can uh, work itself out without violence really. Um, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, there, there will be some kind of a uh, political resolution to this. Um, uh, the opposition people are pretty determined. They're pretty angry. Uh, they want to see uh, their votes counted. Um, and uh, they just don't want a recount because they don't um, trust what's on, in those uh, ballot boxes. So they want a rerun of the elections. And rerun of the elections so far is not acceptable to, to uh, Mr. Khamenei, the supreme leader, who decides on these big issues. Um, and and uh, there we are. Um, uh, the fact is um, that if it goes on like this, uh, then uh, you know something has to give. And my impression is that probably the hardliners are very um, um, easy uh, with the option of going uh, uh, using force. Um, we've seen that in the past 30 years in Iran. And um, so they may not hold back uh, for much longer. And uh, this is what I fear, basically. Afshin, a turning point that can only end in violence? 
Well, firstly, I'd say that uh, members of the panel, you, you two know Iran much better than I do. I've been there a year and a couple of months, mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't pretend to know as much about Iran, uh, given, given my much shorter period of time there. But uh, I have, I'm an ex-BBC person. I was at the Today program. I've uh, also been at CNN, at all, very, a whole bunch of uh, broadcasters, Al Jazeera Arabic. Um, I have to say the reporting, I feel, of uh, the events have been uh, uh, tendentious at, uh, at best. I uh, don't see it the way that you're seeing it at all. And um, partly because I think there's such a lack of information. We'll get onto the internet and the sources used in journalism. I mean, I'll never forget walking into the Today program editorial office when, uh, and I know these countries are very different, when there was a U.S. Uh, partly organized coup against Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. And uh, I remember the editorial team saying a return to democracy. Um, and I, I remember telling them, uh, let's have a look at that shot there. Uh, just tighten the shot a bit. And uh, as you focused in, you saw a Chanel compact. I'm not saying that's the same at all in Tehran, but uh, certainly the independent polling before the uh, election suggested that Ahmadinejad would win. I don't know either way, and I don't think, uh, I don't believe any of us here do know who won this election. I do know that there are policy differences here when it comes to Iran and notably the economy, and I believe that uh, the BBC, as it always has, in recent years, um, and perhaps always, has uh, supported the side that will uh, increase inequality in different countries. Okay, Annabelle Sperney. I've been working on Iran for 30 years, and I claim the high ground. I wrote the book, Small, <laughs> Medium, Big Revolution. That's not now, that's 30 years ago. I don't claim this is a revolution now, although people, the nation and others are already saying Twitter revolution, Facebook revolution. I think my argument would be what I'm interested in is the way repressive regimes work, the way cracks appear within them, and the way pent up popular dissatisfaction, anger, alienation and inequality rush in to take that space. And in that sense, I think there is a parallel between 30 years ago and now. 30 years ago, of course, it was the Shah's regime. It's a very different historical moment. There had been a long history of political parties. There'd been a long history of trade union organization. And although in the immediate period the Shah had pressured those, there were still deep political traditions to be built on. Over the last 30 years, Iranians have found it very hard to reinvent participatory political organizations. It's been very hard for unions to, uh, to be active. It's been very hard and increasingly under Ahmadinejad, face-to-face -face politics amongst the women's organizations has been very, very difficult. Political space has been completely compressed. So I think Iranians are sadly always at a moment of reinventing politics. And I would argue that the move toward the internet, the move toward Facebook and Twitter and all these new technologies is a function of the lack of political face-to-face -face organizational space that people have had, particularly under the last five years. So I see a crack and then people will use all sorts of instruments available to them to tell the story as they see it. And I think one of the things that we do see is the demand. This starts with, and the big slogan, the ongoing repeated slogan, is where is my vote? That people want nothing more than, although they might, they want nothing more than this, but they might, might also want more. They want nothing better than having their vote count. This was a move. We could see the election, I would argue, was a kind of viral election. You could see the campaigns kicking off um, in the last sort of two months before the election. Again, using uh, internet technologies, using color symbology, using rallies, um, Musavi's uh, wife speaking about women's issues. It, to most Iranians, I think, began to feel like this is an election that matters. There are real campaigns, there are real figures. None of them are going to crack open the system, but here, 
democratic openness is beginning to develop and this election might matter. Hence, you've stolen my vote, hence the sense that was that all a charade? Was that all pre-planned? What is the regime uh, you know, has the regime really just reacted in horror at the oppositional voice, the sense that this election has been stolen? And then the consequences which ripple out. Once you open a, uh, once a rift opens, who can control it? I would say, just agreeing with Kasra, I, Kasra Nouri, I'm, I'm also very worried about the consequences. I do not see this is going to end slowly or easily. I'm not sure how it's going to end, but it's going to be a struggle. Sina, your thoughts? <coughs> I think that there are similarities and differences between today's situation and 30 years ago. You know, the main difference in my view is uh, today's society in Iran is more fragmented and the support more for is more fragmented. Power. There are more different demands, different agenda uh, between different layers of the society. And uh, the support for Ahmadinejad or the regime, as they say, you know, the, the government, the governing body, is more than the support for Shah and uh, his cabinet 30 years ago. Uh, but there are similarities, and one of them is, in, interestingly, in the role of media. And with all these differences and developments in the media scene, I think there is one thing similar in, in the uh, media scene today and 30 years ago, and that is uh, people are turning their backs towards the uh, traditional forms of media and using more simplified uh, personal media for communication. 30 years ago, it was um, an illegal copier in, in a house, copying a message and sending that to, to other people. Today, it is internet, Twitter, YouTube, blogs. And uh, I think um, we can talk about that later, how uh, digital media now uh, open that personal space uh, through satellite TVs, through a high pen penetration of internet use in Iran, uh, to a mass population, and it helped the mass demonstration. I think it is a turning point. I agree with Castro about that. And I, I think this is a turning point in uh, Iran's contemporary history. And I think whatever the outcome of this uh, dispute is, uh, the Islamic Republic, after this unrest will not be similar to before that. There will be a very significant change in the structure of power in the media scene. There will be a significant change in the, uh, in the relationship between the political center and the clergy uh, and how they interact uh, to each other. Uh, it is very difficult to predict how it, what will happen, especially in Iran. And, I think the events in the upcoming, one, uh, upcoming week can give us a clear, more clear picture of, of what, what we will expect in the future. Um, Kasha, a question for you. It struck me over the last few days that although we are seeing some very dramatic coverage of what's happening on the streets, obviously, in Tehran, we are hearing virtually nothing, perhaps for obvious reasons, of what's happening behind the scenes. Do, does anybody have any idea of what is happening within the governing structure, within the political elite? Um, we don't have that much information about what's going on behind the scenes. There are signs here and there that we can interpret and, and, and basically read the tea leaves, if you like, sometimes. Um, one of two things is becoming clear to me. One is that the leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran are pretty divided as to how to go about dealing with this situation. Um, obviously, I think the overriding um, um, want is basically to crush this and go back to square one, back to where we were three weeks ago. But I'm not sure whether that's possible. But that Some doesn't include Rafsanjani, for example, does it? I'm sorry? That doesn't include Rafsanjani, who backed Mousavi before the elections, who occupies some fairly critical positions within the structure. Where is um, he? Where, where, where is he? What, where does he stand? Uh, um, he is the, uh, the head of this all-important uh, council of, of um, uh, expediency mm. council and also Majlis Khobregan, the experts assembly. Mm. These are the uh, Majlis Khobregan, particularly, is important because 
technically speaking, that council has the power of, of choosing the leader or sacking the leader. Uh, these, this is a council made of, I don't know how many, I think 70 something, uh, uh, senior clergymen from throughout Iran. And one of the, the, the um, job, uh, one of the um, um, jobs is to basically um, uh, oversee the the, uh, the leader and how is, is the whole thing is working. So they do have the technical, um, technically they do have the power to replace uh, Mr. Khamenei. I'm not saying that is on the cards, not yet, um, because um, all these centers of power, as I said, uh, is in the hands of the hardliners, supporters of Mr. Khamenei, and Mr. Khamenei has never Never been as as powerful as he is today in Iran's history. Uh, he was chosen by a small council of three people, including Rafsanjani, to replace Ayatollah Khomeini. And in the last 20 years, when he became the leader, in fact, he was a, a relatively a junior um, uh, clergyman. And in the last 20 years, he spent those 20 years to consolidate his power. He's pretty powerful today. And I don't think uh, removing him is going to be that easy. Um, but the main point that I'm seeing these days is the indecision by the leadership. Exactly. By that leadership, I mean uh, Khamenei, uh, the uh, top leaders of the Revolutionary Guards, the Basij leaders, the Guardian Council, uh, and all those uh, intelligence agencies. We have the Supreme National Security Council, which all the big wigs of the um, regime are there, and they are they seem to be sort of inactive because basically they don't know how to deal with this thing. And the strength of the opposition is lies in their sheer number. If they come out on the streets in hundreds of thousands as they have done in the last few days, I don't think these people can do anything. The security forces cannot deal with that kind of a number on, in the streets. Uh, they will have to wait basically for this energy in the streets to dissipate and maybe then move in and, and crush it if they can. But as I said, th there are signs that they are divided and they have no clear idea of how to go forward. Annabel, just with a 30-year perspective, uh, just take us through two or three similarities and differences that you see between 79 and now. Well, to repeat a little bit, I think the similarities are in both cases people are struggling to enact politics. And because the spaces for politics are so squeezed, media, information technologies become the important spaces okay. for politics. And of course, in Britain, you know, we know politics is communication. Mm -hmm. It's face to face, it's rallies, it's internet, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I think the argument now that this is a media revolution only misses the fact of the difficulty of enacting politics. So that's, uh, that's a, the similarity. The difference is, as I said, 30 years ago, there was a more recent history of political activity that's really been foreclosed. So I was in Iran in the autumn, and I spoke to women's activists, I spoke to some union people, I spoke to university professors. People said it is very difficult, for example, to have a gathering like this. To, to find an independent space and meet and discuss. So at some level, what people want is people are claiming a space for debate. They are asking for some kind of transparency. We can all recite how the regime seems to work. Do we know how it works? And what is the role of, I would just, to, to be interactive, you know, of the Iranian channels in explaining how things are working? So, in a sense, the demand is the same. I would also say the difference now is I think you've got a bigger bourgeoisie. Mm. Iran has been opened up to global markets in the last, last five years, very unexpectedly. Mm. Tehran is full of enormous billboards advertising Nokia and Siemens and men's clothing and leather furniture. You know, people want money in their pocket to spend. It also means that the rhetoric, I think, now against 
the, uh, the reformists, the people mobilizing the street, that they are Western simply won't wash. These are children of the revolution. These, there hasn't been the same um, people on scholarships studying in the West coming back in 1977, 78, 79 to make the revolution. These are children of the revolution. These are Muslims. The green color is highly symbolic, highly important, as is the demand tomorrow to go to the mosque to mourn the loss of life. This is from within the Islamic Republic, but with the world now visible through all these channels that we're describing. People don't want to be cut off from the West of the world, from nice goodies, from money in their pocket. You know, that's why, in a sense, it is a reform process. It might end up creating more than reform. This was overthrow the system 30 years ago. We haven't quite got to that in, a, in the sense of an articulated demand, although the dynamic may take us there. Afshin, you were suggesting when, when you spoke a moment ago that you think that the way in which this is all being reported here is skewed. And the context of this whole and discussion. Just tell us what you think is happening. I think, but before that, I've got to say, I, mean, I agree with Sina that there's fragmentation. But uh, certainly my colleagues, uh, former colleagues of Press TV, I mean, the way that you frame the debate, both of you, with the we and the they, is, is uh, quite surprising. We, and you call it a repressive regime to start with. I mean, uh, in uh, this country, after all, we've never elected our present prime minister. And just remember the prism through which many people I see. I thought this was about Iran. Of course, it's about Britain today, right? Just, uh, just the prism through which many people do see it. Uh, certainly, people that I've spoken to, car workers, people from working classes in Shiraz, in Isfahan, and other places, this is in the context of a war 200 miles away from Tehran that may have killed upwards of 2 million people. We don't know, no one was counting. So let's just put it into context that the way they see it and the way you use these words, repressive, uh, the numbers of people that have been killed but, just but ex miles Explain away. to us through no, your will, prism. No, through I will. Well, I, but I'll just say that yeah, I wanted right. to lay out that yeah, context yeah. because certainly that's not the context in which you are all talking in. Uh, certainly, internet access is by no means the way you are all talking about it uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the regions of Iran and so forth, and, and even in South Tehran. Um, I think it's obvious what you, all three of you want for Iran. Um, it's, uh, I think we should all agree that it's up to the people of Iran to decide their futures. I understand the cultural discourse of the way, I think when you said nice goodies, they want nice goodies. You see, I'm not sure that in developing nations a policy of nice goodies is necessarily the way the people of these countries want them. And I think uh, the these way you countries? reflect, by these countries I mean, um, uh, I suppose the, the third of humanity or, or more that is below it, I think these countries don't want, uh, they want some of the things you're saying, some of the people, some of the different people, but they don't necessarily want what you guys want. And I think uh, at Press TV, certainly at the newsroom, uh, we reflected that reality, which is of a, um, a world very different to the world that all three of you want. And I have to say, I mean, as I said, I got on fine at the BBC. I, I noticed that the way they covered developing nations was a skewed similarly but to what this, would I'd like, just, would as I'd they, just as they covered uh, problems uh, in this country. What I'd like you to do, I mean, you've you made it clear that you don't agree with the way in which it's being framed by other people here. But I'd, I'd like you to explain how you would frame it. How I think would that, you describe think, what has been happening for the last sure, week? Sure, and I think and I think there have been notable exceptions. I think France 24 has been quite good, actually. Um, I certainly, I'll get, uh, just a quick example. Yeah. Um, Channel 4 News yesterday, I think uh, they started off by saying the demonstrations, the foreign reporters are not able to cover the foreign demonstrations. They went to some grainy mobile footage. And then they went to perfectly clear footage, which is on the state broadcaster. Mm. They were trying to give the idea that they weren't being covered. I have to say, I know of lots of people, and of course, the people who work in TV in Tehran are bound to be from the upper middle class families. I would say, from my gathering, 70% support your context uh, amongst the TV journalist classes mm. in Iran, and certainly are very much the vanguard of what you three want for Iran. But that doesn't mean that's all of Iran. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way it's being covered, well, I mean, I, I mean I've always quite liked Robert Fisk as a journalist. I've noticed how 
in The Independent, his pieces have changed as he stays there a bit longer. I mean, I would suggest that uh, when you say Iran is, Tehran is covered with billboards, it's not. And, um, and uh, I, well, well, I don't think it is, and I've lived there, you know, I have lived there in here. Maybe I was in a different part of Tehran. Maybe. Yeah. All right, but I, but I would like to hear from Sina because Sina has, threat, has individually sacrificed and done a lot in his own right, far more than I have. I do take what he says with the. I, I want to get from you, Sina, your initial thoughts on how significant the new media, the interactivity, have been just in the last few weeks, in the run-up to and then the aftermath of Election Day? First, I have to make it clear that I don't personally want anything to happen. And I just want to <laughs> observe it. If I use any word that suggests that, that it is because of lack of English skills, so I cannot be as careful with English as I move with Farsi. And I, uh, my personal experience in Iran, you know, the, maybe I was too weak, but uh, it, I learned a lesson that you know, Just you explain know. a little bit what your, what your story was. You were a blogger, right? I was a blogger, 23 days in solitary cell. Some threats, some threats happened later. Yeah, this was to when? To my family, 2003. Okay. Uh, I decided to don't want anything for Iran. I want something for myself. That is to be a fair journalist and see what's happening in Iran. I, di I did it in a fault. It is that. So, uh, if I use the word or something that suggests uh, that I have a view that has to happen, I think I believe that has to happen in Iran, that was a mistake. I, I don't have that. Uh, about the use of new media. I wasn't saying there was anything wrong with having that. No, 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 no. I, I don't believe in that because I cannot pay the price anymore, so I don't want to, uh, to put an agenda for some other people 5,000 kilometers away to, to follow my uh, agenda. Um, about new media, I think you are right. Uh, the penetration rate is much higher than 10 years ago, for example, or four years ago. Still, it is uh, contained to the, some layers of the uh, society. And as I said, I believe that, uh, the Iranian society is very fragmented. So um, the interaction between different layers is very uh, limited. And I think one of the failures of the reforms movement in the late 90s was uh, they failed to open a dialogue with the people who were not their natural audience. Uh, so it is exactly the case uh, right now, or four years ago, if I may say. You know, four years ago, if you look at um, if you would look at uh, blogosphere, you would think that either Moin will be a clear winner of the election, or the election will be boycotted by the large number of Iranians. That was the message you would get from the blogosphere. It didn't happen. And with all the calls about the fraud and cheat, that was not that significant to change the message. That do you think the, the Western Iranian media? Do you think the Western media have paid too much attention to the Iranian blogosphere? I think it was. Uh, yeah, they, they paid too much attention four years ago okay. because that was not representative. I think two things happened in the thing. One, you know, other than the natural rise in the penetration, right, uh, uh, the penetration rate of internet and change of the uh, profile of a typical internet user and things like that. Two major things happen <coughs> in the society. One is, uh, I don't know how to call it, the, the figures in the society, in the community or in the family who were uh, opinion makers, they changed. Now more and more younger generation students, more educated people are in a position to to, um, to have an influence on the opinion of the, their family, their community, the whole society. And those people are more, uh, you, uh, you know, they use the internet more than mm. the average Iranian and average Iranians. The second thing which I think is very important in terms of media is uh, this convergence in the, uh, between different forms of digital media. So now, Yes, you got a footage on your mobile phone, you put it on the YouTube, you tweet about it, you write, uh, somebody will pick it up, write a uh, story in, the, in his blog. And still, nobody in Iran may sing it, see that. Not just because of the lower penetration rate, because it is blocked, uh, you cannot have access. The, the, the blocking, the ban on YouTube was lifted for a short period before election, it is back now. But now you have all these satellite TVs, who, does, who do not have access directly to Iran, 
to the field. And they use the user-generated media uh, in a huge number. And they broadcast it back to the country. So even people in the regions that uh, have no, no access to the internet because of the ban or because of the economical reasons or anything, they get the message from those uh, satellite TVs. Yes, satellite TVs are expensive also, so it is not like IRIB in every home. But as editor of the Persian TV Interactive, judging by the calls we received since the launch from different regions in Iran, from different uh, people from different uh, economical class, cultural background, political affiliation, I can see uh, that it has a good penetration in different layers of the country. And that resulted in a, in a mass demonstration. Uh, the interesting thing about this mass demonstration was if you look at the pictures, I was not there, or if you look at the pictures, uh, you would see people demonstrating and supporting Musavi. That if you see them in the street and you ask me, who do you think they support? Mm. I would mm. say Ahmadinejad. Mm. Because I think for the first time in Iran contemporary history, the main demand is democracy. It is not about modernization. It is not about the liberal freedom. It is not about economical uh, issues, which were in the past. It is the first time it is about my vote. But how many people were executed when Musavi was prime minister? Uh, I didn't vote for Musavi. No, I, no, I, mean, I didn't care I mean, for was Musavi. Prime you know, I don't know. I, I, I haven't been a journalist when Musavi was a prime minister. I was 15 years old. So uh, I think many figures put it at yeah, thousands the, the and thousands. The difference, I think, is at that time, oh, maybe the main issue for the, for the real opposition inside Iran, not the opposition outside Iran, was not human rights, democracy. Now it is. Now people are more concerned about their vote uh, than they were 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Democracy became the main demand. And all the, all the attributions that is affiliated to that, like accountability and transparency, I think this is the main difference. And is Musavi a you know, perfect symbol for this movement? I don't know. If you would ask me before the election, I would have a different answer. <laughs> I cannot say that. The people inside Iran, uh, not the people inside Iran, as I said, they, they are fragmented. Some of them see Musavi as, uh, you know, for, for them, Musavi is his, his politi political background. And they decide to support him or oppose him or be indifferent. Because he's become a symbol of, of something different. Is something different right. for them, symbol yeah. of uh, 1980s. For some other people, Musavi is the symbol of today today's movement, and they, they decide to support, support them. What we have to do now is see how it happened, and how he, can, uh, he, he was able, uh, in his late 60s, to, uh, to regenerate a new profile for himself. So I just want to ask you one very brief question, then I will throw it open to everybody else. Um, just based on what you have seen over the last few days of messages coming in from around Iran, because obviously the bulk of the coverage that we've seen has been from Tehran, just, just in a, in a moment, tell us how much else has been going on outside the capital, from what you know. We received lots of um, user-generated videos from provinces, from small cities, all, all across Europe. Um, clearly, the demonstrations from both sides mm -hmm. in Tehran is, is huge, and it's not comparable with what's going on in the provinces. We received lots of messages from people who left their provinces to come to Tehran and join the demonstration right. because they think that is the thing. Again on both sides? Uh, no. Oh, one one, side. one of the things is uh, for, for, for us, for, for, for the program I'm working, one of my big challenges is because of, all the, uh, because of all the restrictions, we don't have a direct access to Iran. So we rely on user-generated content. And who is sending the user-generated mm -hmm. content? The people who think that they don't have the platform somewhere right. else. So we receive more user-generated content from people who are against the government than mm -hmm. from the people who are pro-government, because they, th they think they can. Uh, now IRINN has <coughs> even an interactive show, so they can call them and, and talk to them. It is, more, it is easier for them to, to spread their message. That's one of the challenges that we are facing. Uh, uh, but uh, it's a bit like Rupert Murdoch. And when I said we, Rupert Murdoch's I, I, I press concentration. Yeah, when, I, when I said we, I said I, I meant oh. Persian Interactive. I didn't mean uh, I mean uh, Khan because I didn't. I, I, I do not belong to that. And uh, but it seems that 
The thing is that it happened in the Khatami's first election. It's the message in, in uh, di different provinces is the same as Tehran. All the, the rift is also. So there are supporters of Ahmadinejad. There are a larger number of people in the street, at least, so, uh, against him. And uh, there are clashes. Uh, sometimes clashes in the, the pictures we see, clashes in provinces, especially with, in the traditional part of Iran, and more religious part are um, harsher than what we are. What's going on in Tehran? Okay, raise your hands if you've got a point you'd like to make or a question you'd like to ask. Wait for the microphone to get to you, if you would, and it'd probably be helpful for everybody if you would just identify yourself and if you do represent an organisation, tell us what it is. Um, yeah, gentleman there first of all, and then somebody at the back. Thank you. I'm Mark Grigorian, and I have a question to the panel. Uh, in recent years, we have seen a lot of. Uh, events which can be vaguely similar to the ones happening now in Iran. And I mean the colorful revolutions in the countries of the former Soviet Union. Uh, I mean, it, it, and it's not, I mean, it's, uh, they have finished both in successes and not successes, whatever we call a success. <laughs> and basically in those countries we can see a pattern. When the government, when the powers, those who are in power, see the elections as a way of legitimation of their own powers for a certain period ahead. And the opposition, it doesn't see the opportunity of coming to the power through elections, but they see that there is an opportunity of, you know, becoming the government uh, as a result of post-electoral processes. Now, do you think there is a similarity here, or whatever I say is just speculation on very vague sort of uh, okay. uh, understanding? Thank you for that. The gentleman right at the back. We'll take two or three at a time, I think. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pendar. Um, I was actually in Iran uh, about up until about a week ago, and uh, I found this very interesting uh, listening to the presidential debates happening. Um, going in a several parks in Iran, me and my mom, when we were talking together, we were asking people, are you going to vote uh, prior to the debates? And people were saying, no, not really, because they're all the same. And as Afshin said, that you kept on hearing the word they. And it's very interesting because the four presidential candidates were all pre-approved by the Guardian Council. And then we had the first presidential debate on TV, where, which was between Mir Hussein Musavi and Ahmadinejad. And Ahmadinejad just laid into Mir Hussein Musavi on a personal level, attacked his wife, uh, Zahra Navad, who's a, uh, who's a leading Iranian female uh, thinker with 30 books in political sciences, to her credit. Uh, then she, he laid into Hashem Raf Sanjani, a president for eight years in the previous uh, period, he laid into Hatemi, another uh, president for another eight-year period. And all of a sudden, you were asking yourself, well, actually, who is they? Who is this government? Because you have... Um, the person who is the president, incumbent president, having the right go at the head of the assembly of expert, head of the expediency council, and just having a go at everybody. And that actually got people excited. The debate started at 10.30 in the evening. It finished at 12 o'clock. At around 12.15, I started hearing noises at the end of our street. So people were starting to demonstrate, just completely impromptu. People just walked, back, walked out. And so did I, and my, my dad and my mom just saying, oh, don't go, please, because you're going to get beaten out to a pulp, as it happened last year, right in front of our house. So people went out, and nobody was fighting. You had uh, about 50 people from Ahmadinejad's camp, and you had 2,000 people from Mir Hossein Musavi's camp demonstrating. And then night after night, it's kind of carried on. I think people just got a little bit wiser to, to the fact that you can actually go into the street, demonstrate, and nobody's going to beat the hell out of you. And that was about 14 days ago. It created so much excitement. So night after night, more and more people went out, to the extent that I remember about eight or nine nights ago, I went to Park Melet, which is one of the big parks in, uh, in Tehran, and you had about 3,000 people on one side shouting pro um slogans, and you had about uh, 300 people on the other side shouting pro Ahmadinejad slogans, but they were not fighting, and the, you know, the authorities were just standing by trying to direct traffic. And I found it very, very exciting, because it was the first time in my life I'd actually seen expression of um, your thought and, and by very young people who are all children of the revolution and nobody was beating them into a pulp. It was really empowering. And um, it 
was almost one of the biggest disappointments of my life when I woke up on Saturday morning and ran my dad in Iran to find out that actually Ahmadinejad had won. Ashley is quite right to say, well, well, do we really know about the kind of the surveys were saying that, public opinion was saying that maybe it was uh, Ahmadinejad has some more votes or so. Actually, I just saw some other opinion polls which actually put Musavi number one, Reza as number two, and so on. One of the things I would encourage okay, all the... Keep, keep it brief. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah. just give me 30 more seconds. One thing I would really encourage all the reporters to do is this, uh, to really forensically go after points that you can really put a lens on it and actually say if something is wrong or not. On the night of when the election results was being announced, after 30, after 30 million votes were counted, Mohsen Reza's vote count was 630,000 votes. After 4 million more votes were counted, that's 34 million votes, his vote total count went down from 630,000 to 570,000. <laughs> now, please, as journalists, pick that up, put it under a lens, and report on it, and don't let it go. Because that is just so obvious there was some cheating going on. Why do you going to be talking about I think, or they think, or they think? This is fact number okay. pres Sorry. Okay. presented the, by the authorities. Point, point made, point made. Um, Animal, just on the colour revolutions, um, Europe 20 years ago, whether it was East Germany, whether it was Poland, huge numbers of people on the streets brought down well-established authoritarian governments. Do you see the same thing happening now? In I mean the recent colour revolutions in Ukraine, Georgia, Ukraine, Georgia Kyrgyzstan, fine. Moldova, yep. with different effects. I mean, I think my response would be to, in a sense, piggyback what we've just heard from the streets of Tehran. We're talking about 14 days here. Or perhaps with election campaign, we're talking about two months. You know, the speed of this. I would say uh, we organized a conference on 30 years on the social and cultural impacts of the Iranian revolution at SOAS on the 5th and 6th of June. I do not hold that conference responsible for what has happened, but it's quite an interesting sort of before and after. We had many people who decided not to come from Iran because they were taken up in the political process. We had many people who couldn't come. Um, they, uh, the British Embassy was not uh, facilitating, and they had problems with the regime, and they couldn't come. One of the repeated senses of the conference on the 5th and 6th of June was that the dynamic between Iranians has changed. Right? Instead of the old slogans and ideological positions, people were starting to talk to each other. There was a new set of issues on the table, particularly about creativity. We had young musicians saying, all we want to do is play rock. We're not even particularly political. We want to just be the best rock band, you know? Why can't we do that? We have women filmmakers who say, we want to make film. Why can't we do that? There was a new set of subjects, a new set of people speaking, and it wasn't down with the regime, it was we just want some space. We want to speak. We want to be creative. We love Iran. We're Iranian. This is what we want to do. So I think my response to the, the color revolutions is it's far too early to tell. Right? This whole thing, I mean, depending on, of course, which moment one, one takes, is very, very, very fast. Uh, you know, it's not a revolution. I mean, you know, probably revolutions are only named after the fact anyway. This is some kind of popular, very, very popular in terms of numbers, response. We don't know where it goes. Kazra, just looking for a second at the run-up to the election, I mean, there plainly was a debate. I mean, there were the television debates. There was a public debate. To what extent were you surprised by the way in which there did appear to be growing public involvement in and interest in 
the, the process and the election itself. I think the gentleman there got it more or less right from, um, from my perspective, in a sense that two, three weeks before the elections, there wasn't a great deal of excitement. Okay. And, uh, Ahmed, and um, Mr. Musavi wasn't exactly your charismatic <laughs> leader that people would want to vote for. Um, he's one of those, by the way, one of those quirks of history that from time to time they thrust <laughs> upon these unlikely characters on unsuspecting nations. <laughs> and you have something, you know, you cannot quite work out what's happened here. It's one of those cases. Um, and, and I think, uh, again, uh, our friend over there, um, he's got it right in the sense that maybe it was all to do with Ahmadinejad's doing in a way that he was very rude to everyone, he was attacking everyone left, right and center, and that must have created some kind of a backlash in sort of decent, amongst the decent people here and there that, you know, he was attacking, attacking the pillars of this revolution. And suddenly people were thinking, oh, what's going on? Who's this man? Why is he attacking? And he was questioning the whole, the last 30 years of the revolution. And he was, by, by inference, really, he was undermining this whole uh, uh, clerical uh, government and the regime in Iran because he was questioning everyone. Um, and and uh, that, I think, led to a good deal of excitement. And then suddenly, people uh, decided that maybe there's a chance here we can, we can change things. And they came out in big numbers. We didn't expect this kind of a turnout. Um, uh, you know, uh, ask, if you asked me two or three weeks, two weeks before the revolution, before the revolution, before the, uh, before, before the elections. It's catching. Yeah. Before the elections, um, I would have said that it would be, there would be a very low turnout. And high turnout, by the way, in Iran is always in favor of the reformists. Right. Because the high Hardliners always manage to bring their own people out anyway. Uh, they've got a certain number of votes, and every, at every election they bring those people out. Uh, in general elections, they have about 10 million people, uh, and they get that more or less there. Uh, anything beyond is out of um, uh, ordinary. And, and this time, because the turnout was high, therefore the proportion of those people who would have voted for Ahmadinejad to proportion of those people who wouldn't vote for him, uh, it's a bit screwed. But uh, having said that, I've written a book, 300 pages on Ahmadinejad. <laughs> I, 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 I researched this pretty um, um, deeply, actually. He does have a great deal of support. There's no doubt about it. He, in fact, the last years, he, dis he used the last four years as if he was on a campaign, election campaign. He went to every remote village in the country. Every, uh, my uh, research showed that every two weeks he spent about three or four days in rural areas, in villages, in places that we as journalists, within, I sometimes didn't know where these places were. I had to look on the map to see where the, he was speaking today. He, does, he did this for four years. And he went there, he spent money on those places, he promised them uh, electricity, he pl promised them water, he promised them uh, uh, telephone lines, bridges, roads, all sorts of things. And of course that turns into votes. But th let's not forget, rural areas, uh, urban areas, you're talking about 40% to 60%. 40% of people in Iran live in uh, rural areas, 60% in the cities. It's the cities and the economy, the way he managed the economy meant that the, he lost the cities. Afshin, what's your, do, do you see a connection between that period running up to the election, that growing sense of excitement, that growing sense of involvement, and then what happened afterwards? I think, um, uh, I, I was actually with Ahmadinejad a month or so ago. I'm not sure how much I, I learned from him on my various encounters with him. Um, I completely agree with the presidential debates um, uh, uh, illuminating what was going on and really catalyzing this uh, discussion uh, that was going on. I wish I wish Britain could ever have uh, debates. But did it give people, do you leaders. think, a sense that there was a real, uh, a real choice on offer? And, uh, well, I was about to say, I, I wish Britain could have debates between the party leaders that would 
Uh, I mean, as I, I've said, the, the elections here, Gordon Brown, what was it, his party got 16% on a turnout less than on Big Brother. Um, I think it is useful always to compare these things because the way certainly you presented Annabelle is this is a very exotic country of people wanting rock music. Um, I certainly don't think. Uh, no, it's the this, ordinariness. I don't that think is the important. discussion of democracy mm -hmm. is new in Iran. I think uh, ever since the revolution in '79, there have been groups, underground groups, even before the internet, were uh, discussing the direction of the revolution, and uh, so many people. Um, uh, as, as I've said in, in my pieces, have been disappointed about that direction. I think um, uh, turning, turning from, I, I will get onto this, this point about, uh, I think it's very salutary what you were talking about, about the color revolutions, because um, I'm uh, afraid that, uh, that the people who are, I suppose you call it reformers, in allying themselves with certain, uh, uh, certain groups that, uh, about which they're uncertain, uh, has the same pitfalls as they did last time around. Um, as for those color revolutions, the embrace of the uh, free market and globalization agenda, which, as you say, involves uh, that consumer culture of art and culture as well, uh, I think a lot of those countries are now turning against that as they see how destructive the, those economic forces can be. And I suppose in policy terms, it is very interesting that Musavi Although it's being reined back, and I have certain advisors of his that I've spoken to are now saying something different, but certainly I was always given to believe, and the Council of Foreign Relations and Capitol Hill seem to believe, is they want liberalization, they want to open up their markets to private investment, and so on. And uh, I think a lot of people in Iran do not want uh, the kind of uh, IMF-style privatization policy that we saw in those color revolutions that have destroyed so many of those former USSR countries. Okay, one over there, one at the back, and then two at the front. Uh, yeah, there, uh, lady there first. Yeah, no, yeah, we, yes, yes. There's the microphone. Hi, um, my name is Dorothy Parvaz. I don't work for anyone. Um, so I'm curious to know if any of you guys have read anything solid on um, just how irrelevant who Musabi really is to the protesters, because this man, you know, he's in his 70s, retired from political life decades ago, um, handpicked by Khomeini to be prime minister back when Iranians had one. So he's hardly really the choice for the young generation. I mean, I'm close to the age that a lot of these people are protesting. I was six when the revolution happened, and I'm sure that a lot of them don't really recall the fervor that brought the revolution to the streets of Iran, and so they don't really identify with it. So who Musavi is, especially in a system where the Guardian Council chooses who gets to be a reformer, and they chose a pretty flaccid one, if I may say so, um, it's, it's almost irrelevant. What people want is something different. He, you know, Musavi is no change agent. He's no Barack Obama, right? So have you read anything about this? Have you reported anything? I haven't seen anything. I've been reading and reading and reading, and all I find is Musavi supporters when it's really just the people who want change, not so much Musabi, but change. OK, thank you. A gentleman at the back. Um, a few things to, uh, I want to talk about, if I may. Uh, first one is uh, the, you have been talking about um, media and the role of media and what it talks about. And, um, one of my observations is that it has, in my opinion, has too much, uh, it has concentrated too much on images, uh, important and uh, effective as they are, and little about some of the things that actually can, if I may call, investigative journalism. It is right in front of your nose. I mean, the smoking gun that we're talking about is right in front of your nose. Rezai, who is the uh, leader of the um, Revolutionary Guards, former. Ex -command, former commander of the Revolutionary Guards. He was the head of the Revolutionary Guards during the Iran-Iraq War, a major, major character in, in the Iranian system. He basically is, what he's got is, um, he did a random sampling of a thousand uh, ballot boxes. He knows the number of the ballot boxes. He knows where they are. Now he's asking the government, the, uh, the uh, Guardian Council, to tell what, what the result of each one of the ballot boxes is. There is an information asymmetry between what he knows and what the Guardian Council knows. He can irrefutably prove that there has been fraud in this. And nobody is talking about it. He can, he can mathematically prove that there has been a, 
uh, that there has been fraud. And what we have right now is that the government is saying, I'm under no legal obligation to, to, uh, to tell what this information is. This is, this is a line of attack. If the Western media wanted to really push this, they could really put, they can really lo laser on this one, and they would get a lot of. Uh, they can't. Okay, thank you. Well, you say that. Actually, actually, hold on. No, no I would completely respect your point of view. I completely yeah, press agree. TV, but press there TV is has that. mentioned it, but, uh, you know, the, with all due respect, for example, I know that every single comment I put on your, uh, on your comment section in I'm press there TV now. has all I been. I left during the election period. Okay, has all yeah. been uh, filtered out. So I have no confidence uh, in, in your news channel. Just, just address that's that very quickly. Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. Uh, second, second about the lady over there. Khatami was a, a minister under. Um, under Mir Hossein Musavi's cabinet. He was the Ershad, he was the propaganda minister. He made a big <coughs> difference in his, in his uh, uh, first term presidency. He did have an agenda and he, has, he was pro-candidate and he did uh, push the uh, agenda as far as the freedom of press was concerned, as personal freedoms was concerned. These people come from the same tradition. It is not a question of oh, it's a little dust that falls within the supercritical liquid and suddenly everything crystallizes into a, um, into a rebellion. Okay. There is a tradition there that, that exists. Really. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, if you take one more at the back and then we'll come to the front. Thank you very much. Uh, my question really follows from the late first lady who asked her question. Say if Musavi does get in this time round or next, in your opinion, what change will you think he will bring? And can he realistically, realistically bring it? Or are the Iranian people once again putting high expectations on something that may not deliver okay, fully? Thanks. And Thank the, the two short ones, I hope, down at the front, and then we'll come back. Hi, Catherine Hogg from the FCO. Um, I just wanted to get a view from you as to the implications that recent or current events may have on the human rights situation in Iran and on civil society as a whole? So Thank that you. That was my favorite length of question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to match it that way as well, yeah. Um, when, when the election uh, started, my quick observation to my dad back at home was that I feel it's now more movement-centric, uh, no longer personal-centric, but the fact that Khatami came in pulled out in favor of Mr. Musevi. And the second one that has been branded. Um, my observation is not a movement that's much more established. To, uh, was it today or yesterday? I don't know. Mr. Majorani in uh, his interview with BBC said that the Iranian democracy is under attack. Given the uh, implication that there was either a potential for a democracy in Iran or that one exists and it's under attack. My question is to Afshin and to you. I'm sorry, I've missed the beginning. Don't, don't know your name. Um, my question is to you two gentlemen. Um, Given there's a more established movement now fighting for uh, a cause such as practicing democracy in Iran a little bit more, um, what is your speculation if this current movement doesn't end into an annulment of uh, the presidential uh, elections or um, Mr. Ahmadinejad moving out of office? Okay, well, let's start with that, Sina. I think um, <laughs> there was a line connecting all the yeah, exactly. <laughs> about the result of the election, mm. and I think. Uh, Whatever happens, as I mentioned in my first answer, is irrelevant. It doesn't matter who is going to get the office after this election, because it is not about that anymore. It is changing the fundamental relation between <coughs> the people and the power, the, the, uh, the governing body. Uh, it is about accountability. It is about even uh, we were talking before the, uh, before the panel uh, coming here uh, downstairs, and we were talking as even if the uh, the results are totally genuine. Uh, the way it was announced was not managed properly because you have to build the confidence. I wouldn't be sur surprised if Ahmadinejad won the election, especially before the debates. I, I wouldn't be sur surprised that Ahmad, uh, if Ahmadinejad had got more votes than uh, Musavi before the debates because, as many people mentioned, the debates changed the scene. But. There was something happening in the middle of the debates, especially when he mentioned Zahra Rahnavar, that uh, added a new concept to the whole uh, movement, and that was respect. And it is very important. It is not about nice goodies, or it is not about the, uh, the, the, the power, uh, the, the economical <coughs> power to spend on the Western goods. It is about the basic thing that even if you want to campaign for, for a people of a small village, you will go and say, 
yes, people are so poor that uh, uh, if, uh, an old father cannot buy necessary goods for their family, so he will be ashamed. It is about the respect. It is not about the goods themselves. And Ahmadinejad actually uh, managed to uh, unify all, all of the people who were opposed to him. Uh, the, the whole the, uh, um, around the, the slogan about respect. And now people are saying, respect my vote. And from that, from that is a slogan they get to democracy. I think even if Ahmadinejad stays in the power, uh, or if Musavi comes to the power, it doesn't matter the next president what they will do during their term. It, it is, uh, the important fact is now the, uh, the people in power in Iran are more aware about the role of media. They are more aware that there will be a reaction to their decisions. They will be more careful about their judgments and, and assessing their power. And I think this is a very, very big thing happening in Iran today. Afshin, you wanted to come in on Mr. Rezai and his role and what he may or may not actually know about what happened. Well, I suppose on the, there have been many mathematical uh, calculations based on the different pieces of information we're getting out. I do understand what you said. Then there is a counter one. The Washington Post had a different one. Then they were saying that even if you calculate it using the maths, you can simulate mathematical distributions which would create these sorts of results. They could have done it in that way. That's why I don't think it's... No, it's it, about statistical. They, they took a random sample. That's right. I, I am aware of that. They know what the number of the ballot boxes is, and the government doesn't know what the number is. But the government... Okay. And right. It's, 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 it's a very minutiae. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The point. But I mean, in general, I would say that uh, when it comes to... I think the point about the election, and whether it was rigged or not, is now... It's now past. Uh, because this is like discussing angels on a pinhead, because uh, both sides will. It's rather like the one for George W. Bush. Uh, you know, eventually people said George W. Bush got in. Um, on uh, on, I, I would say. I mean, two uh, two other. Council is going to make. No, I, 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 you, of course. You did have your say. Of course, to be of course they will. No, and I'm sure people will still be discussing it. And I and I would agree with you that in Tehran, in order, and what you're saying is the thing that's discussed more than any other. Um, I would. Uh, I don't know. I think you were. You were no, I, I've got one other thing I want you to address, though, right, which was right. the question that came: How much real difference do you think it makes which of these two men, Ahmadinejad Mousavi, whoever emerges from this whole process as president, how much difference does it make? I think I think there is a huge, there is quite a big difference, uh, actually. I, I, one thing that's never mentioned nowadays is that Vanity Fair piece by Cy Hirsch, where uh, he outlined the fact that the United States was spending 400 million dollars in a covert action plan to change the government of Iran. Uh, no one really talks about that. Uh, I certainly, from the people that I know in Iran who support Musawi, have not received any of that money. Uh, we don't know where, where that money is going and how that money is being distributed. Um, perhaps the Foreign Office pressed in the front knows. Uh, but uh, as, to, as to the, as to the I'm difference, not even looking at as that. To, as to the difference uh, between the two, it is very difficult. I mean, I'm sure Zina has a better handle on this, but I was led to believe that he was very much in favor of globalization and so forth. I think much has been written about uh, the Rafsanjani family. They're, they're a very important family in Tehran, I'm sure. Both my colleagues here will be able to tell us far more than I would about uh, their role in Iranian politics and uh, politics around it. It's a very dangerous thing talking about them quite often, as uh, some journalists have found. And uh, as for Musavi himself, I suppose some people think that he, he is a bit of a proxy for the Rav Sanjani family. On the human rights situation, mm -hmm. I, I would say it is very difficult. You know, I, I did work for the Today program. I know how they hounded our source to commit suicide uh, for a war that killed so many millions of people. It's very difficult even to comprehend answering a question about human rights to the British Foreign Office. OK, Kazra, Musavi Ahmadinejad, to what extent do you believe they do genuinely represent two different political streams? I mean, given that Musavi is himself a man of the system, isn't he? I mean, he comes from within the structure. I think when he actually entered the race, he wanted to be the candidate of the both sides. Um, he didn't call or um, describe himself as a reformist mm -hmm. when he started. And um, I remember his first statement um, mentioning that he's going to run in these elections. 
uh, was one of those that you wouldn't know where he stood <laughs> on many issues. And he wanted basically to have the both sides. Uh, Musavi is that kind of a person. But things changed uh, since then. Things changed during the debates, te the televised live debates, changed during the week before the elections, and now after the elections with these results. Uh, Musavi is not the same person. Um, OK, if uh, two or uh, three weeks ago, if you'd asked me uh, what is the difference between these two, I would have said, OK, Ahmadinejad, bombastic, populist, all this, um, hardline, and Musavi less so and more sort of, you know, dilly-dallying about everything and, you know, not quite sort of know where he stood on many issues. But now things have changed. It's got to the point that he's got these people behind him, and these people have genuine demands for change. And they are looking up to him to deliver that change. Uh, whether he will be able to deliver or not remains to be seen. But nevertheless, he's under pressure to go all the way, to stand up to the hardliners, demand their votes back, demand change. And if for, uh, you know, let's say in a week, two week time, um, uh, he is president, he will, he will be a different kind of president in a different circumstances that, that, the, uh, that is different to today in terms of relationship between the president, the government, and the rest of the uh, bits and pieces of this regime, including Iran's supreme leader. He will be in a position to raise his voice, to push his own line in a way that he wasn't able, had it not been for these changes, that these upheavals of the last few days. Just go to Annabelle Can for I make a second. Yeah, um, and I'd like you to address the human rights question as well, Annabelle. Sure. Can I make two, yeah, two additional points about Musavi? First of all, I think he also brings with him a reputation for economic and financial management, right? He took Iran through the Iran-Iraq war, managing the economy, Iranians did not starve. I mean, you know, a long war. Iranians managed to survive. It was very, very dif difficult. So I think he has a reputation as an intelligent manager of the economy. And if we're doing sort of British-Iranian comparisons, which I think is a very interesting thing to do, don't get me wrong, um, one of the issues around Ahmadinejad's uh, many people that Ahmadinejad has tried to appoint to key posts is precisely embezzlement, having their hands in the public till. There are big issues of what has happened to large amounts of money, and certain people have not been able it's to be... Are suggesting Ahmadinejad is corrupt? I'm suggesting there have been people around him who have been corrupt, and it's been very difficult, and there has, I was just going to say, actually, there has been some due process, it was one of the few elements in the last year or so where there was some due process, where people, um, where the majlis actually stepped in and said, not these people, right? Um, so I think, the, I think the, the management of the economy is vitally important. Um, globalization is a piece of rhetoric. I think. The, the, I would argue that the economy has opened up colossally in the last five years. Um, brand names are beginning to open up inside Tehran. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I am not saying that's a good thing. It's, it's a dynamic that is happening under Ahmadinejad now. These are pressures from within and from without. Um, so I think any person, any leader now will have to deal with the pressures of the global economy and a pent-up demand for consumption of all sorts of things. Consumption includes clothes, it includes newspapers, it includes DVDs and CDs, it includes cars, um, you know, all sorts of things. And it's very hard for us to sit here and say, ooh, I mean, I think it's interesting that Iran is now positioned as kind of the leader of the developing uh, world. I mean, Iran is I didn't an oil. Say it was a leader. Iran is an it's oil economy. Of... You know, it is sitting on a colossal pot of money, and I think many, many people want some of that to trickle down further than it has. I think the argument about and so that's my point about Musavi and finance and the economy. And I thought we, you know, it is the economy stupid here and there, partly. The second point is it is the polity stupid, and key, I think to the mobilization of support for Musavi was his wife, his Hamsari. We, the Iranian women's movement has been growing slowly. 
with colossal difficulty over the last few years. It is before this period. Been using the internet, there is the one million signatures arguing for equality under all laws in Iran, right? Arguing against bigamy, arguing for family law that allows women to raise uh, households. And of course, there are many women-headed households because of the tragic war that Iran had to endure. Um, women are fighting for a whole range of rights. And having Musavi's wife there speaking to the women's vote and saying, we will address these issues. So human rights is partly gender rights and equality. Um, there was a very powerful film circulating in the last few weeks by Rakshan Bani Etamad, a wonderful um, feature filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, who interviewed a range of women, um, Tehrani, Isfahani, small villages, political activists, heads of household, <coughs> ordinary women. She got them to articulate their demands, and she then showed what she had recorded from women to the would-be, you know, to the presidential candidates. Uh, you know, Mousavi in that film and uh, Rahnava speak articulately about how this is one of the first things they will have to address. So, you know, I would say the economy and women help shift things. Sina, you just want to say one more thing? Uh, mostly I was yeah. interested in uh, Annabelle's uh, words. But <coughs> there, two, there are two things about Musavi. First uh, is uh, he was able to um, you know, gather all people from different backgrounds around the a flag. Uh, his rhetoric in the first statement was more principalist even compared to Ahmadinejad. And the fact that he was retired from the politics 20 years ago helped him to have an appeal to, to the both sides of political spectrum in Iran and gather those people. And the second thing about uh, Musavi is, I think, in the regenerating his profile, the day after election was very important because he did something that Khatami never did in eight years. See, he, stand, he stood by, uh, by his supporters. And uh, if you compare it uh, with 1998, where Khatami completely you know, uh, stepped aside and didn't want to be related to that unrest in Tehran, you can see how different he is. So I think in this regenerated profile, the people are more important, his supporters are more important elements. They created a new profile which has nothing to do with his political background or even uh, how he wanted to, uh, to show himself. And that's the change in representation I, I mentioned. That, that is bigger than Musavi's cabinet or Musavi's term as president or Ahmadinejad. OK, we can, woo. Um, right, I'll squeeze as many in it. One there, one there. Let's take those two first and see how we're going. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me that which you didn't agree with the uh, definition of repressive for Iranian regime. Uh, can you d d define repressive in your opinion? What, what is a repressive I've regime? Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Okay, okay right fine. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, sorry. Uh, I'll do one more question. Quick one. <laughs> I think by every definition, the Iranian regime is a repressive regime because people are not allowed to sing whatever they, they would like. They are not allowed to watch satellite TV which is a very a basic rights. Ahmadinejad, which you are very keen to defend him. He was, in, he was involved in killing Castle right, in 1989 you, you in You asked a very good question. Let, okay, let one more see question for no, the no, 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 no. Sorry, I've got to stop you there, because there are so many more people who want to ask a question. Uh, uh, no, stop, very stop short. that. Let, let, very short. Let, let my microphone go to the back of the hall. Yeah. I'm sorry, but it's only fair to everybody else. Yeah. Uh, Farah Nayeri from, from Bloomberg. I'm, I'm a journalist based in London. Um, I had a couple of questions. The first one is the, the, the movement that we're seeing now of hundreds of thousands of people going into the streets unimpeded, virtually unimpeded, it is unthinkable, would have been unthinkable 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when we had the student rebellion that, of course, was suppressed. What is it about today that makes this possible? This is something that would have been completely inconceivable up until maybe even two years ago, maybe even one year ago. What is it about now that's made it different? And secondly, what is the chance of this being crushed and ending in bloodshed and going back to square one, if members of the panel could, could give okay. the chance of that? Thank you. And I'm going to take two from this side. Yes, there's a lady there and then a chap further back. 
You can take it in the other order if you like, you take, take him first, as that's right. Thanks. We've, we've talked a lot about um, the reasons why this whole kind of protest is happening and the anger of the people. Um, a what if question for you. What if Ahmadinejad stays in power and actually goes so far as to change institutional law and maybe even follow Hugo Chavez's position and make the presidential term unlimited as opposed to even going up for the kind of next election as a kind of reaction to what's happened now. OK, thanks. And the gentleman there, yeah. And that, I think, will have to be it. Um, you've spoken about the factions within the um, Iranian power structures, but, um, which I imagine is kind of one of the things which is helping the opposition at the moment. I wonder to what extent you feel that if the current regime makes any concessions to the opposition, the potential factions have been, uh, as have been alluded to here, within the opposition, are then going to start playing out, and that that could then present a problem as to what, what exactly are the aims of the opposition? Do, do they really have the same aims? I mean, um, I, I, I wonder to what extent that's going to, what, what will need to happen for that to, to be opened up by the current government to, so they can play on that with the possible factions okay. there. Right, OK. Um, one question specifically for you, Afshin, which was your definition of repression. We'll come to that in a second. The other questions were, why have these demonstrations been allowed to develop in the way that they have done in a way that wouldn't have been possible a decade ago? What would happen if Ahmadinejad does indeed stay in power? What are the implications of that? And we've spoken a little bit about factions within the power structure. What about factions in the opposition? How united is the opposition? Let's just go around, starting with you, Sina. I think the reason that these demonstrations were allowed to continue for the nearly a week is first the sheer number. The number is not comparable with what happened in 98. At 98, I was a reporter in Iwa and I saw that demonstration. It is not comparable with today. Again, the role of media is very important because now it's open to the eyes of the world and, and it is broadcasted back to Iran. So uh, it gained more. Uh, Cross uh, uh, layers of uh, support in Iran. It has some more support in different layers of the society. And uh, one thing about uh, Ahmadinejad's reaction, the government, is I think he again uh, did, uh, did a mistake with, with uh, having an oversimplified solution for the problem by cutting the uh, the communication tools, which, uh, like SMS messages, text messages, uh, filtering the internet. Uh, why I think this is a mistake, because um, it cut the communication um, tools between Musari and the supporters in the street. And uh, it, uh, it can affect the Musari's ability to contain the demands in a realistic, achievable level. And if the uh, co uh, communication between the leaders and the supporters in the street is totally cut off, there is a very big danger of uh, ending in the bloodshed. I think I answered a few questions. Mm -hmm. Just a factionalism in the opposition. I mean, to, to what extent is there a, a united opposition goal, and, and, and how, how much of a risk or how likely is it that if any concessions were offered to them, they would then start to splinter? You need to, uh, you need to have a leader or a leadership mm -hmm. to, to, to negotiate a concession, negotiate uh, with, the, uh, with the government then that leadership needs to be able to, to uh, lead, uh, actually, and, 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 and uh, ask the people to go back to, to their homes. Cutting the, all the communication uh, channels between Musavi and his supporters is a very dangerous thing to do, right. because it happened during the student unrest. Uh, students in the street were, uh, were very unhappy about their reformist union of uh, students. And that union lost the power to control the, peop uh, the students in the street and the people who came out to support them. So the smaller, more uh, extreme groups among the opposition uh, became uh, able to, to lead the movement and take it to the ra uh, radicalization, and then it uh, ended in bloodshed. OK. Kasha. A very interesting point, actually, uh, that um, this uh, cutting off communications in Iran, uh, switching off mobile phones and SMSs and um, zapping BBC and stuff, um, is is uh, is going to affect both themselves and 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 the opposition, and it could, as Sina just said, could help 
uh, get the whole sort of thing out of control of Museve and the leadership of this thing. Uh, after all, the, these uh, the, these guys were the pillars of the revolution. They don't want to go too far. Um, and, and having said that, also, um, uh, having lived in Iran uh, until last year, uh, um, I don't think people in Iran want a revolution. I, they've seen one before, they've suffered for it for 30 years, and today I don't think um, people want this thing to get out of control and uh, you know throw up something completely different and new which they don't know what it is and they have to get used to it for another 30 years before they can they want to change it um, what they want is change but the, everyone you talk to they want gradual change they want uh, normal things they don't want to rock the boat they don't want to uh, start bloodshed like it happened in Iraq in the aftermath of the invasion there or in Ar in Afghanistan or some so and um, there is that uh, on the question of what's happened on the streets is basically um, the anger runs pretty deep. 83% uh, of the eligible voters went out to vote, and that's quite a lot. You're talking about 40 million people, and these are a lot of them are young people, uh, under 30, 35, something like that. And they are angry at seeing their votes stolen from them in this brazen manner uh, and in the way that the authorities are putting it out. And you should have listened to Ahmadinejad the day after in his uh, election victory. It was frightening to listen to him emboldened by this, thinking that there's, there's nothing which can stop him now. He was bad-mouthing everyone again, left, right, and center. It was, it was one of those speeches that should stay in history as one of those, those uh, bombastic things that you only see in books, history books of, you know, in the 30s kind of thing. And, 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 and it's, it was frightening. As, and also the sheer number, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people on Monday, actually, more than hundreds of thousands, um, went out on the streets. There's nothing you can do in any country under any regime. Security forces have to stand back. With that kind of number, you can't do much. As for Chavez and Mr. Ahmadinejad, they're good friends. And I'm sure, uh, having listened to him make that uh, frightening speech, it was easy to conclude that in a year or two time, Mr. Ahmadinejad might well decide that he wants to be president for life. Afshin, there was a very simple question for you. Ooh. Your definition of a repressive regime. Yeah, that's And a, why you say this one was not. That's, was not. A, that's a good one. Um, I, I think most regimes, if not all regimes in the world, are repressive. You went to Glasgow East, where life expectancy is lower than in Gaza or Iraq at the moment under UN figures they call it repressive. So of course Iran is oppressive. I couldn't sit on the same stage as someone who's been in solitary confinement in a prison in Iran and not say that there's a degree of repression in Iran. Come on. Um, so I mean that's the answer to that one. Um, <laughs> is Iran repressive? Yeah. Yes. As as all governments are. Okay, there's your answer. There's your answer. Uh, so, actually, your, 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 your answers to the other points, then. Well, I was just, I was quickly going to run yeah. why have the demonstrations been allowed. Yeah. That is interesting. I have to say that over the past year, there have been demonstrations every week against the government. Some of them have been uh, resulted in a fair degree of uh, bloodshed, not very reported uh, elsewhere, certainly not by the big media um, uh, at any rate, but certainly on the blogs and so on. Uh, the uh, uh, the Shanghai speech of Ahmadinejad, I, I beg to differ. I think it was a terrific speech. But then Shanghai, I didn't mean Shanghai. His victory speech oh, that in, in Tehran. I thought you meant like the Chavez. No. Yeah. I, think, I think the world, uh, I don't think uh, President Ahmadinejad and the role of the presidency has anything like as important a role as in Venezuela. But uh, I think, again, if you look at Venezuela against all the way the media is covering, particularly the BBC and, of course, CNN and other channels, uh, things are getting much better in Venezuela under any normal UN indicators, mm -hmm. and, uh, education and uh, all the rest of it. And that tide is running right across Latin America. So I hope the media will uh, will figure that one out. 
Uh, regarding uh, internet freedom, I, I take Sina's point completely. TV access, we all agree advertisements are important, otherwise businesses wouldn't spend so much money on them. Uh, if you are a small country, uh, I don't know, Haiti, Cuba, of course, before uh, being bombarded with images which are one-sided, which, uh, which I think they are from uh, the corporate media, uh, I can understand why governments uh, in situations want to uh, free up their populations by uh, choosing what TV. I don't, this idea of depoliticizing it and turning it into a sort of NGO style idea, either you do this or you do that. It's about the people, it's about getting them fed, their health care, them getting employment. It's not about allowing uh, big companies, uh, which are behind a lot of the corporate media, getting in there. So, uh, I, I, but I would just say, talking about repressing people at the moment, Britain and America are repressing Pakistan and Afghanistan, and, uh, and that's in the region. And these are the neighbours of Iran. And, uh, no, 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 I, I, I'm going to stop you. Annabelle, you get the last word. Come on, sir. You, 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 right. <laughs> you haven't got a microphone. Nobody's going to hear you. Shh, shh, shh. Uh, yeah, I am, yeah. <laughs> Chairman's prerogative. Annabelle. <laughs> Um, I, welcome, you know, I welcome the new articulacy and political debate in Iran. I don't think there's anything further really to say. I think the question about speed and spontaneity are very, very important. And I think there the new media play a role. If people have been silenced, if people do not have a space with which they feel free to speak with each other, once they begin to see on Facebook, which is kind of safe, or on Twitter, that other people think like they do, solidarity begins to build. When I was in Iran in, uh, when I was in Iran in the autumn, people choose spaces in which to discuss things. You get into a taxi, and people are debating politics. You have an SMS, and you are getting political jokes. The women are mobilizing with difficulty. And I bang on about women because if I don't, you know, the men won't. <laughs> huh? Huh? Um, you know, it's not as though there were not powerful signs of discontent. I had took endless taxis. If anyone who's been in Tehran, you know you have to get endless taxis to get around. You get stuck in, in taxi jams. I got somebody who'd been working for the Basiji all day. He put in, I think, a 10-hour day. And I was the first person he picked up in his nighttime taxi run. But he said, I'm working for the government, and I cannot survive on my salary. So I have to go into private enterprise, run a taxi in order to survive. You know, the economics is absolutely fundamental to this. this is, these are urban populations who cannot survive. Void the rural populations, although perhaps they're growing their own and it's not so bad. And of course, it's the smaller cities which have grown colossally, uh, not just Tehran, in the movement out of villages to the smaller provincial cities, where the economy is really, really dire. I think once people begin to see that there are others who think like them, it begins to mobilize. And I think it's kind of Gladwell argument, not all well, but Gladwell. It's, you know, you get a tipping point. You get dynamics of scale as more and more people come in very quickly because they see what other people are doing. So the crowds are part of that. The new internet, uh, you know, all the technologies are part of that. We see now, we hear now how others feel whether we agree with them or not doesn't really matter. We actually see people have ideas, people have arguments, people have political positions. This, the genie is out of the bottle. Good line to end on. Thank you very much. <laughs> I know there were more people who wanted to ask questions. I do apologize, but we can't go on all night, I'm afraid. So thank you very much indeed for coming. I hope you found it interesting. I sir. On your behalf. Thank you. Thank you.